Steve Rusciuto, when you talk to Dominique and the two of you get together, are we in recession? Uh, the NBER will not classify it a recession. To me, you know, two quarters of consecutive negative GDP reports, you know, implies you're in a recession. Uh, the problem for people is going to be that this is going to be a very shallow, very long recession. It's not going to be the typical recessionary mm -hmm. environment uh, that we've seen um, in since 1990, which were credit cycles, nor is it going to be the typical inflation cycle uh, that we'd experienced in the post-war period up to the 1990s. It's a very, very different cycle. It's a long, shallow cycle. Right. Well, within that, and this has been the theme for the day, Steve Rusciuto, uh, if, if you have a long, shallow cycle, does that mean the real message from Powell at Jackson Hole will be a more sustained view of interest rate strategy and not the foolishness of the when the rates come down? Oh, that's exactly been our call all along in here, that we were basically looking at a dynamic of a pause, not a pivot. Uh, the question that we're still debating, is it 4 percent or is it something north of 4 percent? I think we have to get to at least 4 percent. And the last time I was on, we were talking about it. We were pricing 3.5. Now we're pricing something in between the 3.5 and, and the 4. Uh, I think we'll get to the 4, and you know, hopefully that will be the end, but it may not be the end of this scenario. This is the raise and hold debate, Steve. We caught up with Jan Hatchis of Goldman. Take a listen to what he had to say. Where I would disagree more with market pricing is the pricing for significant rate cuts. I think it could be a couple of years. I mean, really? if you get to the, you get to the you know, mid threes or, or maybe even a little bit higher and then, then you stay there. Because I think while inflation will look a lot better a year from now, I think it'll still be significantly above the target. Race to what and hold for how long? Race to three, three and a half percent and hold for a couple of years, Steve. What do you think of that? Well, I, I think we're going to keep on moving higher than that. I don't think three and a half is the top. Uh, and nor do I think necessarily we're going to hold it for several years. I think we're, there's clearly an argument to be made that we're going to hold it through 2023. But where we go in 2024 is a very, very different um, animal altogether because you have to look at what's happening in the currency and you have to look at what's happening with supply chain related issues. And then you have to look at the demographics in the labor market environment. And it's this tug of war that we're going to see from a stronger currency supply chains easing up versus the wage-related pressures that are being dominated by the demographic issues, in particular, the reduction in the number of workers from the millennials to the Generation Z, which is now entering the labor force. So we might wind up in an environment where the Federal Reserve has to sustain higher rates on a longer basis than we've seen in here for quite some time. But again, what the starting point is is still an open book. What's the advantage, Stephen, for the Fed raising rates beyond three and a half percent. What's the end target and why, especially if they plan to then take them down to something lower over a longer term? Well, again, do they plan to take it down to something lower over the longer term? The, the real question is, how does this labor market dynamic play out? You can make a very, very strong demographic argument that the labor market stays tight throughout the entire period in here, uh, and therefore you are in a sustained higher level uh, of interest rates going forward. Uh, the question always is going to be, what level of rates will that be sustained at? But a quick return back to the near zero interest rate environment uh, that we've been anticipating is going, or that people have been somewhat anticipating is going to require some kind of credit event to unfold in the economy. And when you look at the underlying credit quality of the economy in general, there are some pockets where we are concerned, but in aggregate, the balance sheets are still very, very healthy. So what is your uh, top Fed rate that you're kind of penciling in here? How has that evolved over the past few months? Well, it's evolved a lot, I mean, over the entire period of, of 2022. Uh, but, but I do think 4% is the near-term target. Um, and I think once we get to 4%, we will pause for a time. Whether or not that's a pause to go higher or a pause to right. continue to hold that level on an ongoing basis, that's where my thought process is. Steve, inside baseball, if we've got China with subpar China growth, the dynamic of exports minus imports – how does that change and what does that mean for Chairman Powell? 
Well, again, that comes right back to the currency story because it's the supply chain dynamic. You have a slower global GDP environment. Clearly, what's happening in Europe is creating a wider GDP output gap globally. You have a strong currency, which will allow us to import those products on a more, on a more competitive basis, which will wind up dampening domestic inflationary pressures. And then you wind up with where does the services dominate over the goods portion of the equation? And I think yeah. this is the reason why inflation is going to come down, whether it'll get as quickly as the Fed would like to see back to their target or not. I think it'll get there. I think it'll get there probably in 2024. I don't think it'll get there in 2023. Steve, my first exercise this morning was to look at the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index for the United States and for Europe and to note back over 30 years that this is the first time they've diverged so sharply. Now, obviously, there's a war in Ukraine, which is uh, 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 dealt to this. What does Bailey say to Powell or Powell say to Bailey on this immense transatlantic divide? Well, I mean, I, I think you know, the, the situation is the reverse of what we experienced in the 1970s, where the um, you know, Federal Reserve Chairman at the time, Paul Volcker, came back from an IMF meeting uh, and was forced to change monetary policy abruptly and cause you know, one of the worst macro recessions, inflation recessions we've seen in, in our history. And I think all of the problems on the uh, currency side of the equation are really European problems. Um, and Europe has to address its issues. We can't fix its problem for them. Uh, and that's pretty much the same message that, you know, Paul Volcker got uh, in reverse uh, when he came back from the IMF meeting in 1979, which was basically, you have a problem with your currency. That's why your currency is going down. You have to fix your problem. And I think Powell has to push it right back on them. You've got a problem. You have to fix it. We can't fix it for you.